Hi, everybody. Just before we start, this episode contains discussions of sexual assault and suicide. So please do take care when listening. If you do need to talk to someone, in New Zealand, you can call Healthline on 0800 611 116. If you want other options, they're on our website, www.rnz.co.nz slash fried chicken. Take care. Hi, I'm depressed alcoholic comedian James Norquise. A couple of years ago, I had a mental health breakdown which resulted in panic attacks on international flights, stepping in front of an oncoming bus, and eventually showering so long that I began to get a little bit hungry. And that's when I discovered something magnificent. Through the magic of takeaways and running water, it turns out my mental health safe space is eating fried chicken in the shower. And that's how we've ended up here, a mental health podcast on headspace and happiness. This episode, I'm talking to comedic duo Fan Brigade. We'll chat about finding yourself. You can live a confident and happy and rich and rewarding and fulfilling life and have anxiety and panic attacks. Finding some help. Between us, we're like diagnosed with half the alphabet. <laughs> and finding a friend. Why did we cook so well? Um, Because we're know. both very mentally ill. Yes. Some of this will get a bit real. The language, the subjects. So make sure that you're in a safe space with your comfort food. And join us, eating fried chicken in the shower. Hi, and welcome to Eating Fried Chicken in the Shout, a mental health podcast with me, James Nokise. And today I am joined by Amanda and Livy from Fan Brigade. Hello. Hi. Hello. It's so great to be here. <laughs> I almost fluffed your, um, your name there. <laughs> I went to say from, and then I went that, and it just came out fra, fra Fan I don't Brigade. I think anyone's ever said Fan Brigade the first time. No. Almost everybody says Fran Brigade. Fran Brigade. Fran Brigade or Fran Brigade. Yeah, we get a lot of Brigade. Brigade? Yeah. What's the what's the worst interpretation of your name you've heard? Um, ugly sluts. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, Fat on funny fucks. Yeah. Is that being introduced um, or is that just fan mail? Slag twats. Slag, uh, fan oh, mail. Yeah, we get them. And being yeah. introduced sometimes. Yes. Fan behaviour. Yeah. Uh, introduced probably just like they're feminist bitches. You yeah. probably won't like them. Yeah. They're fucking horrible. <laughs> It's, it's so weird that when you use the lang a certain language, uh, I know exactly who you're talking about <laughs> to, to I was introduce it. Like, that's a very specific person. That's a very specific uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. way of introducing an act that yeah. you know is going to do better than you as an MC. <laughs> Sick shower there, James. Thank you, man. That's a, I, try to, I try to bring a luxury shower uh, oh. for my guests. What are, you, what, are you, what are your thoughts on the shower? Very communal. Thank you. Yeah. Is this really where the rugby players? Yeah. There's been a lot of dicks in this room. Of... Yeah. <gasps> do you think there's pubes in there? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's where they do cricket too, don't they? Yeah, cricket. Oh, so cricket football. Here. Football. Women's football as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, really? You know. They make the women use communal showers too? I think, I, I think the women get to choose. Oh. I don't know. I think they, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert on the showers. <laughs> I'll be honest, I just use it for eating chicken. <laughs> what chicken? Fan Brigade. What chicken have we got? Um, a rotisserie chicken. Rotisserie. Yeah. Um, it's too many dietary requirements. Okay. Um, we wanted to eat the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And have it like a classic New Zealand dish as well. All right. Which is, so I see there's some coleslaw some kind of as well. Coleslaw? Chicken and coleslaw. Chicken and coleslaw. Yeah. Where's the anything? buns? Uh, I don't know. No, 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 no. I can't eat buns. You can't eat buns. <laughs> oh, we didn't get the buns. <laughs> Ladies, uh, here is your chicken <gasps> served up. It is uh, the finest bird on a wire. A uh, full chicken. I believe it's the first full chicken we've had. Whoa, there we go. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yum. dinner. This is like an unboxing of a bird. It is. Uh, Get the dead bird out. Oh, thanks. Uh, oh, oh, here you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I've got a plate. Thank you. Mm, for you. Yum. Okay. All right. Get Come it mixed. It. Is it really good? Yeah, it's good. How long have you two known each other? Eight oh. years. Maybe. 2014? Yeah. Can I count? Is it? No, seven, seven years. Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and we've known each other this well the whole time, basically. Yeah. yeah. Like love at first sight? Mm. Yeah, yeah, we was. Mm. Yeah. We um, met on Twitter. Mm. And then... Really? Yeah. And oh, then nice. I went and stayed at her house the first time. Because that's what you do when you meet a stranger on the internet. That's true. That's an example for everyone. You drive to their house and then you get... 
absolutely shit faced and stay there the night the first time you meet them. Have you talked to other people about your own like experiences? before you'd met each other as, as like openly? Because I think what I've always enjoyed about you guys is you, you've got trauma, right? It's, it's deep trauma, it's bad trauma, and you are, are able to address it with humor, but like you don't, you don't shy away from the trauma, you just do it in a light manner to let the trauma be out there and like, you know, it, and allow people to engage with it. Um, no, I definitely hadn't talked to anyone about all my trauma and past experience as openly as I did with Amanda. Definitely not. It took me like, it took her years of like telling me to go get therapy mm. and um, medication <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before I would. Because I was brought up where mental health is a very shameful thing in my family. Mm. Like, I remember when I first, you know, like, I, I was brought up with my dad saying things like, oh, you know, there's no such thing as being depressed and, mm. um, you know, that's like, you bring that on yourself and just, you know, Go, go for a walk or, you know, and like, <laughs> just go for a walk and get some fresh air. That's what you need. Like, um, and, you know, it was considered lazy. And, and I remember when I first got diagnosed with anxiety and I told my sister and she automatically just said, oh, I thought you were stronger than that. Wow. Okay. Because that's just what we all thought growing up. So it took me a really long time to be able to get diagnosed because I refused to see a doctor. Mm. Um, but I actually ended up going into my doctor because I was having asthma attacks. Mm. But it turned out they weren't asthma attacks. That was her panic attacks mm. where I couldn't breathe. And she's like, you don't need inhalers. You need a paper bag. Mm. So, um, yeah, from there I was like, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's a thing. <laughs> maybe I'm having them every day. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should take some pills for it. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's been great and life-changing. It's funny, I was talking earlier to someone about um, representation uh, like from a Pacifica point of view and like being able to have a doctor who you can speak a common language uh, to like how important is it for you guys to like have a doctor who not only you trust but you feel safe because I think I think as a, as a guy you don't necessarily when you're thinking of going to a doctor or getting yourself a GP you go oh you know obviously I have to feel safe as well mm. right. I had a I probably wouldn't have given it a second thought for a long time until I had a flatmate who was a doctor and he told me um a little anecdote about the doctors arguing over who got to treat the hot woman in the ER Okay. And it was such a red flag for me and just gave me such terrible anxiety oh. about ever going to the doctor and seeing a guy. Yeah. Like, her, how is her hotness anything to do with needing treatment? Like, it's so disgusting. Yeah. And I've never gone to a male doctor again ever since. Never wanted to. I never will. <laughs> um, yeah, I would just never go to the doctor again if, if there were no female horrifying. doctors. I know. I know. It really upset me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, my doctor is really good. Oh, let's get more chicken. Um, I, I have always, um, uh, just so I didn't answer your question before, I've always, um, thanks, mm. talked really openly about um, everything for myself. I have a bit of a, thanks, um, mm. a theme, I guess, to my life where I don't, I sort of absolutely refuse to feel any shame. I don't want it. I don't mm. think it's helpful. I don't think it's necessary. So mm. I've... I also think that if you don't have any secrets, mm. no one else really has any power over you. Um, and talking about your struggles openly, I think, is so helpful to other people. Like, and why should it be? Why should it be embarrassing or shameful to have horrible shit happen in your life? Like, everyone has horrible shit in their lives. And um, it's such a relief to be able to get that out of yourself and mm. out into the world doesn't even matter who you're talking to. Probably mm. don't talk to, I wouldn't recommend talking to your family about it. <laughs> yeah. Family is so shit. No. Just, just like, I love just my put family. Just put it in a show, guys. Just put it in a show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, we that's what I do as well. Yeah. We talk about all our shit on stage yeah. and everyone's just like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. When I debut a new show uh, where I talk about myself, I know I'm going to have to take my parents out separately for yeah. coffees afterwards. Yeah. To go, yeah, so there was a second suicide attempt, and uh... <laughs> I just told my mum not to come this year, or my dad, or yeah. my sister. Oh, my like... dad is like on the ban list, like the mm. yeah. every year. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this name is not allowed in. Mm. <laughs> and it's funny, like I, I really, my family are amazing, mm. and I think quite a lot of um, people in my family have a similar mm. struggle with their mental health. A lot of anxiety and um, maybe some depression, mm. a lot of depression. 
but and even though both my mum and my dad have worked in mental health previously, my dad's been a forensic um, psych nurse for a really long time. He's just right. recently retired. Mm. Um, I'm I'm sort of in a situation where I feel like I can talk to my parents about anything, but the advice that they cannot help giving back is just not mm. helpful whatsoever. You yeah. know, it's be grateful. <laughs> And be happy, and don't be sad. Yeah, and don't be anxious. Is my favourite. Tried being less anxious. Yeah, and you know, and and she's genuinely like, Mm. I think that this will help you, and Mm. that's it's really lovely to have that, like loving care and compassion. But I can't just not be anxious, (laughs) and I can't just be grateful, and it's all fixed, like I'm cured because I'm like, oh look, I have a pair of shoes that I like, you know, Mm. or whatever. Yeah, grateful for whatever in my life. Yeah, I'm already grateful and anxious, (laughs) you know. So you can do both. Yeah. So it's like just so great to have friends that do openly share. I think yeah, their struggles. They eh? like we have quite a lot of friends who are pretty open about about it, and I think comedians are famously. I was gonna mm. say open. It's since that we've been in the comedy industry mm. that I've felt well, maybe way more relaxed with mm. talking about it all because. Everyone's got something. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all fucked. We're all we're fucked. Absolutely all fucked. So yeah. mentally ill. <laughs> and now, yeah. when I go to my friends out of the comedy industry, mm. I find that, like, because I'm so used to talking about it so openly within the comedy industry, when I go to my friends that aren't in it, mm. I find they're opening up way more to me now because I'm just like, like yeah. you know? I feel like comedians sometimes are just like actors who didn't know how to get a therapist. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then just ended up on stage just talking their shit, and people were like, "Oh," and they were like, "Oh, cool." Yeah, yeah, because I used to feel like why I liked being on stage was because I could talk about my personal stuff, and people would resonate, and I go, "Oh, cool, I'm not insane." Yeah, because I'm always secretly worried that I'm actually full on insane, and um, and, and you feel like you only have your own personal viewpoint. And then, oh no. And every now and then someone says something and then you're like, oh no, I'm insane. Mm. Mm. And you're like, no, we all are. Yeah. <laughs> and then the community comes along and you go, oh, cool. No, I'm part no, of it. No, this group. is my, yeah. I feel like I'm a part of it. But I used to resent people going, you know, comedians are just all depressed and anxious. I used to be like, not everyone is. And then I'm like, everyone I know is. You're like, no, and no. I know everyone in comedy. Actually, <laughs> some of us have OCD. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wide range. There's a spectrum. There's yeah. a spectrum of comedians. Yeah, it's pretty much because between us, we're like diagnosed with half the alphabet. <laughs> um. <laughs> so what do, what do we got? Give me a hit list. What do you guys, what do you guys got? We both I've, just, anxiety. I've, I've only got anxiety and PTSD. Uh, um. I've got that. I've got in a panic disorder and OCD. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anxiety I the, and I depression. The, I have the panic. Yeah. <laughs> I get the panic. Um, I'm. You might notice like every time I go to take some chicken, my fork is like... Shaky, mm. not very, but that's because I've had two panic attacks today oh, in wow. preparation for tonight. Oh, <laughs> just nice. thought I'd better churn a couple out, you know. Yeah, just so it's fresh. Well, there's, there's no, no, not about this. Yeah, but just just cause. Oh, just generally. Yeah, I can't even remember what set me off now. What is my happy place? I honestly, with your dog, don't know. Yeah, with my dog, anywhere with my dog. Um, I guess, but. I don't have like a routine that I do and I think I need to find something that is a real like happy place and like a healing thing to do. Mm. Is it when we try and trick each other into seeing us naked? Yeah. Yeah. Did you nearly say our buttholes? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we would never we'd never do that. We'd never ever do that. It's like Amanda, come in here quick. I can't do my zip up. And she runs in like, ha. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to be fair, I started that. Yeah. Um, and and ask me. progressively got worse. <laughs> ask me what I think of your butthole. What do you think of my butthole? It's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> so, um, this is what happens after seven years of friendship. Oh. Yeah. No, it's just, well, I mean, what's left to do? Exactly. Is to rate each other's buttholes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Out of ten. 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 Oh. <laughs> Myself. <laughs> Did you say first? When I'm writing my friends. <laughs> yeah, we start, it started off normal, just like talking to each other, you know, with your butt talk. Like, hello. <laughs> How are, no? <laughs> you know, it's, just normal. Yeah, it's normal. You know, what, what mates do? What mates do? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, that's, that's mean of me because it's not like Kiwi guys don't have a history of doing dumb shit like that. Yeah. You know, nah, it's normal. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. Like, yeah, people do when they're really close talk to each other with their butt cheeks. Thank you. It's, Thank it's you. a compliment. Yes. First person to admit it. In our culture. We Everyone else is just like, stop that. We <laughs> also, um, to combat our arguments, we have an argument tube. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It's the tube out of a out of a handy towel. Yeah. Or like a, a roll. We, well, we start off a long wrapping paper roll. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like so a long roll. Um, we put our, up to a mouth each end, and then we just scream, scream at the same time into, into it. it. <laughs> <laughs> you can feel that the person scream in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it actually really helps. We're sure. like right argument over. <laughs> you cannot be mad at each yeah. other yeah. when you're screaming <laughs> down <laughs> a wrapping paper tube into each other's mouth. It heals everything. <laughs> Why does it feel like I don't know, but it really works. It really does. Try it. If you and Laura, if you have an argument, yeah. argument true. You just, just both, one, two, three. Please, yeah. And you can feel the screen. And then you're done. And it can be any tube. You can go with a wrapping paper tube. You can do the handy towel tube. If you're going to really intimate, a toilet, toilet roll. Paper. Let's get some more chicken. Get some more chicken. Yeah. Like, I'm nice still thing. going. I have a yeah. tiny belly. I have um, mental health mm -hmm. talk. Um, yeah. So I've also had eating disorders all my well since I was fourteen. I can't say all my life. I'm mm. like three years old, like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, since I was about fourteen, I always had eating disorders. Mm. So I was bulimic, and then I had um, binge eating disorders as I got older. Mm. And I ended up absolutely ruining um, like my hormone and meta metabol metabolism. Mm. That's how we pronounce it. Um, and so I ended up getting. Um, I had a hormone thing that tells my body that I'm hungry all the time, even when I'm not. Right. Because um, it fires off way too much of the appetite hormone called ghrelin. Mm. And so I ended up, um, after a whole bunch of seeing a lot of like nutritionists, sleep therapists, and um, surgeons ended up getting a gastric sleeve mm. surgery recently, only a couple of months ago. And yeah. they actually cut out 90% of your stomach. And that's the part that makes the ghrelin hormone. Wow. Yeah. And what I wasn't expecting, because my head was so busy beforehand, like mm. I would be eating and mm. could physically feel full and my head was like, you are starving. You are starving, bitch, keep eating. Um, and it was so draining and yeah. so horrendous. Yeah. And I woke up pretty much overnight with a quiet head, which I hadn't had in years. Wow. And that has been the most positive thing on my mental health in all my 36 years. Yeah. was having that surgery. And I've already like halved my daily anxiety medication and mm. my doctor and I are working on coming off it and that was only at the end of March. That's incredible. Yeah. Do you think knowing about like considering other people's traumas like from a creative point of view, like it helps in when you guys are making your own work and thinking about how to, you know, yeah. write, write songs. Yep. hundred percent. We've literally had people come up to us crying like, thank you for discussing that. We thought that was only us. Yeah, cool. That went through that in our childhood or in our... And people aren't talking about it and it's kind of taken away some of the shame for them, mm. which has been really important for mm. us. And we, we consider their trauma sort of first and foremost, like how do we talk about this without tra like traumatising anyone in the mm. audience? Like no one's here to have a shitty time. No, yeah. we've yeah. we yeah. fucked that up for a little bit yeah. um, and learned from that, yeah. like about how to word things, but we're very, very careful around it. How have you coped when um, you've, you've had one of those, uh, let's call it a learning experience? <laughs> Of like trying to talk about something, going, ah, oh, we didn't nail that. Um, it was pretty devastating at the time. Yeah. I had a big panic attack over it, probably mm. a series of panic attacks over mm. it. We had a situation where um, in a song about um, how like your mum will do anything for you, your mum mm. will die for you, and mm. you're like, and we're talking about Which all the terrible, no, 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 I won't. Um, we're talking about all the terrible situations that we are in where it should be a safe place to be and it's mm. not. Mm. Um, and sort of, you know, making it funny, but we joked about a situation that um, had involved, um, I guess, just a few specific people. And it was right. an issue that had been in the news and one of mm. them was in the audience right. and felt absolutely attacked yeah. and betrayed by us. And it was awful. Mm. Which, And looking back, that's a totally fair way to feel about that. Yeah. We hadn't... Um, that through very well but that could happen yeah mm. and the person sent us an email um basically having us up about it and saying like what the fuck you guys like yeah. i mm. didn't expect that from you and we we're like be able to be safe at your show and we're like you should be yeah mm. and you weren't yeah. and so pretty devastating but um 
really grateful mm. that people, f I guess, still feel comfortable enough to tell us mm. that we fucked up instead of like going away and just hating us forever, yeah. like and giving us a chance to make it right and yeah. um, and do better, I guess. Um, because that is the last thing we want, you yeah. know, mm. to go and mix, tra anyone, like re-traumatise someone. Anyone to feel like shit after our shows and we did not do our we didn't put enough calculations care. into that. Yeah. yeah. How do you deal with anger and rage, you guys? Um, diazepam. Mm-hmm. And really long... Um, messages to me. Messages to Amanda. <laughs> I just pull up my keyboard and I'm like... <laughs> 80 words a minute. Yeah. And um, then sometimes if I'm if I if I've gotten over the rage before she's read it, I'll delete them out. I just have to get it out somewhere. Mm. And she'll come back and it'll be like unsent message, unsent message, unsent message. And she's like, no, what was it? <laughs> You're like, it's okay, I'm over it now. Yeah. I'm like, I want to read about the rage. You know I love rage. Yeah. I'm a crier. You're a crier? Yeah, yeah. I'm a crier. I'm a suck and I have a rage cry probably twice a week. That's good. <laughs> um Yeah. I don't know. I don't have any coping strategies except to like be really nice to animals and people like out of spite <laughs> or like uh I don't know I don't think I have any any really good ways to deal with it I'm just a ball of rage all the time right yeah healthy. so it's really yeah. healthy <laughs> so and I have terrifying nightmares yeah um oh, yeah. a lot of the time from yeah. PTSD and yeah. then when I wake up I have to have a lorazepam because I can't calm down and a lot of that feeling is rage that like people are trying to hurt me that bad in my dream. <laughs> can, can I ask about the PTSD? Yeah. I, um, what, it, what it comes from and what it feels like? Because yeah. Because I think a lot of people think of PTSD, they just think, oh, war, conflict, mm. you know. Yeah. So mine comes from, as I said, like a long series of really relentless, really relentless, it's a bit dramatic, Con like Constant, repeated yeah. sexual harassment and sexual assault and um, like to the point of taking former employers to court mm -hmm. about it and um, and so on. And then a couple of um, sudden deaths from people that were really close to me. One, um, the one that affected me the most was my flatmate at the time, Billy Dawson, mm -hmm. who was attacked in the street. Um, he was a very close friend as well. Um, and died of his head injury the next day. Um, I never, ever got over my rage and trauma from that until I read an article with um, that was an interview with his um, the guy that killed him, who, wow. yeah, came out of jail like one of the few people I think that really redeems themselves and feels the weight of that person's life. Surely rehabilitated. Yeah, and I really felt like. Um, the poison like came out of me reading that. I told you I was a crier. Um, that's all right, I always cry. Yeah, she does. And yeah. I do. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I think I inherit it from my mum. My mum always used yeah. to cry yeah. like whenever she had an authority figure, but she'd like, like if she was pulled over by the police, she'd be yelling at us in the back, like, don't pay any attention to this. This has nothing to do with this situation. This is my trauma coming out of my eyes. Um, yeah, so PTSD for me, I, I get the I get the bad nightmares, um, and I get them a lot. And um, sometimes really small things will trigger a panic attack. And for me, the panic attack feels like um, an overwhelming, intense sense of like dread and terror and fear, mm. and this really physical urge to run and escape mm. and there's nothing to escape from and nowhere to go so it's a real um sense of like conflict in your head you're like nothing is happening to the point where I almost thought I was going um psychotic I think the worst panic attack I ever had was walking up to go to the movies up Queen Street and I was outside Smith and Coe and I was just like something bad is about to happen like mm. and all I could think about was a helicopter was going to fall out of the sky onto the pedestrian crossing mm. at um, Victoria St Wellesley Street outside the Civic. <laughs> um, because how could I feel this much terror and dread and horror if something really awful was not about to happen? Mm. And I got like, um, like, sort of obsessed with that image of the helicopter coming down. I had to ring my mum and be like, I think I'm losing my fucking mind. Mm. 
Um, but I wasn't. It was just a panic attack. And, and I, you know, went to the doctor after that because I'd been having them for years but mm. not really knowing what it was. Like, Livy thinking I was just um, short of air or, you know, I'd be hyperventilating in a bar and being like, I can't get any air. Has someone put poison in here? That must be what's happening. Like, someone's put gas in the air conditioning because mm. I can't breathe. Like, how come everyone else is able to breathe? Um yeah, so for a lot of a long time, I had no idea what it was. Mm. Um, after that really massive one, I was like, something's fucking wrong. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I went to the doctor, and luckily I have a really good doctor. It's a weird feeling having such strong um, feelings of terror mm. when I'm, like, also a really confident person mm. and not... You know, I don't feel scared all the time. I feel like once you talked about how you, when you were small, felt scared all the time, right? I've never felt like that. And so I'm just like, where the fuck has this come from? Mm. Like, it's so weird. <laughs> I'm all right. I feel fine. Like, it's just... Yeah. Cleansing. Mm. Yeah. The thing is, is that all three of us have anxiety, but we're also giggling quite a lot. Mm. And I'm thinking for people who are listening to this who are like, hey, you guys are like you know, really relaxed and chill. And I can come and talk to you guys after a show or like, oh. ever, yeah. <laughs> we talk to me. Yeah. You talk to her. Yeah. You won't talk, I'm still up in the green room Sorry. waiting for everyone to clear the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, um, if, if they've got a mate who's like that as well, like that's might be, I know it took me a while to talk my mates through how sometimes I just have to gap and mm. it's not them. But if you, um, if you've got a friend who's got anxiety of, of various degrees, you got any hints and tips? That, um, that maybe they can do to, you know, not to stop it, but to uh, make it an easier experience? Um, for me, I think it's asking what they need at the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people won't know what they need, but um, no judgment, I think, is the main thing. Like, it just happens. It just exists. It is. It's going to happen. It's going to be over. Like, it, it's always going to pass at some point. And sometimes... Um, Someone will just need a bit of space and time. And if I'm at work having a panic attack and I'm like, someone comes to my desk and I'm like, sorry, I'm just middle of a panic attack, but busy. Um, if you can come back in 20 minutes, I'll be fine then. And the worst thing is if they're like, oh, why are you having a panic attack? You know, mm. so I don't find You don't fuck off, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I'm like, the best thing you can do right now is just listen to what I just said and leave me the fuck alone. Um, mm. But another time in another situation, I might be very happy to go, I just need to talk to you about what's going through my head right now and explain it. And sometimes I find that useful. So it changes. And I think you just have to ask someone what they need. Mm. And even if they don't need it, being asked can sometimes just give them the opportunity to be like, it's just a panic attack. Yeah. Or do you need anything? No, cool. And then fuck off. Because yeah. they don't like... I think that when people, like, stay at you, mm. you know, like, are you sure? What can I do? Like, no, you're making this so much worse. Mm. I've, um, I've had and really liked before, would you like me to give you some space or should I stand here with you? We don't have to talk. Cool. Or that's sit, nice. sit with that's you, nice. yeah. yeah. That's really yeah. nice. And I think I've, I've had that before and, and just been like, yeah, if you could just hang out with me for a second but we don't talk to each other or look at each other, that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I ask people usually is, can you go to my bag and get me a Valium, please? Yeah. Or, and I do it straight away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a practical thing, I think, that sometimes has helped both of us, which lots of people can do, um, which is if you have headphones, you can ask if there's a song that they want to listen to. Oh, yeah, you do that for me sometimes. Yeah. Especially uh, for some reason, I always have panic attacks when I get an Uber. Mm. Mm. So she'll throw the headphones on me and put, like, there's a couple of likes and songs. You're a good friend. Mm. Well, I think it's... Um, so yeah, and I think it is a practical thing that people can do. Like, do you want to listen to music or a song? I can pick one, or it can be a favourite song, because um, most people have headphones on them at and you're giving any given them, time these days. You're giving them permission to not have to think about anything else or mm. engage or a engage. conversation. You're like, cool, no, you just do your thing. Yeah. yeah, the expectation to engage with someone is extremely stressful for me when I'm yeah. in that really heightened state. Yeah, mm. and it can make it so much worse if someone's really intrusive. Like, what's going on? Mm. You know, so. Just what do you need? What can I do? Would you like to listen to some music? Because um, I think music is something that really anchors a lot of people to themselves and having that, f having familiar noises going into your brain can help you sort of come back into yourself a little bit. Mm. 
I find. And singing. Yeah. So I remember I was told that if you're singing, mm. you're using such a lot of your brain mm. to coordinate that, that it's hard to feel anxious and upset at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I, get, I get that. Mm. Yeah. And so my therapist was like, if you're having a bad morning, put on songs and sing the whole way to work. And you'll find, because I listened to a lot of murder podcasts, mm. and then I found I got to work really like, Oh, <laughs> another <laughs> woman's murdered. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, maybe try singing. And I did that, worked wonders. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people with anxiety, a lot of women with anxiety listen to those podcasts because there's the background anxiety that you always have about keeping safe and staying alive. And it's almost like clues and information and just mm. hints to sort of keep you... And justifies that we get to be worried about it. Yeah, like, you feel way yeah. less gaslit listening yeah. to a murder <laughs> podcast than anything else, eh? Yeah. I'm really into movies with guns where really? dudes just mow each other down with guns. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. not necessarily the guys in real life who have stickers with I love guns. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's because it's just like men killing each other for like an hour and a half. I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do another one. Gotta catch them all. Yes, Jason Statham. Mo, mo, get them all. <laughs> oh, see, now you that's my dad's favourite actor. So, oh, really? Yeah. There. Come by, rub your tummy, watch Jason Statham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Bruce Willis, like, more, more, more. Yeah. Well, it's usually the women getting murdered and yeah, attacked so and raped. Yeah, it's so nice to see them off each other for, like, two hours. Thank you. What about a film like Predator, where an alien just comes down and only kills men? Great. So <laughs> <laughs> he's like, please, I beg yeah. you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With your guys, um, the traumas that you've had, um, what's, how early does your trauma start? Livy, is it similar to Amanda's? Early childhood. Early childhood. Yeah. When you're older? A little bit older, yeah. yeah. Kid and older. Kid and older. Lucky. Yeah. Oh, that's one else we, we bonded over. We both were raised by people we know. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> At an older age. <laughs> Can we talk about that? Yeah. 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 I, I feel that's definitely yeah, yeah, a, a yeah. permission yes. quite <laughs> like thing. Yeah. Um, from a mental health Normally point of view. Normally people are begging me to stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so this, this is... is exhilarating. <laughs> yes, yes, I will. <laughs> Please, let me talk about the rain. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is good because I feel for our listeners, you know, as you guys are very aware, um, it, it, we're giving them a little bit of space to go, ooh, mm. pause, maybe. Mm. Um, if you're uncomfortable, we can pronounce it... Rape! Rape! <laughs> 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 We might have dated out me laughing at that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, guys. <laughs> Just like, one long bleep in the second half of the podcast, yeah. right? If we're in public and we're like, we don't, we don't, can we say it? No, but we can say rapé. <laughs> but that is the gallows humour of trauma, right? Yeah. That's the absolute gallows. you got to laugh or you fucking cry. You do. Can I ask you, do you know what the rape zone is? The rape zone. Rape zone. Oh, the rape zone. No. I was it's gonna the free car park by in the basement theatre. Right. Under, Under the, the bridge. bridge. Yeah, yes, of course. <laughs> right. Now you've, now you've yeah. mentioned it, yeah. absolutely. That makes, so is, is that a place where it has happened or is that you guys going, that's definitely a place where it would happen? Oh, it's known for that. It's known for that. Yeah. Right. I did not it's know famous. that. It's famous. Yeah. <laughs> and we've been there. <laughs> I didn't realise it was a landmark. But we weren't attacked there, we were at other places. Yeah. So. And you both bonded I was asleep there. in bed <laughs> in my pyjamas. Right. In my I own home. was vomiting over a barbecue table because I was too drunk to stand up, so right. that's neat. I was unconscious, having been a different time, having been given something like 20 shots by my friend and his next-door neighbour, who was 35 when I was 15. Oh, cute. I know. Um, so it's um, like so many different situations, and sometimes like you don't even know it's rape until someone tells you it took me years I was just like like to realize mm. that it was I was I was 19 and mm. I was so drunk at a party that I was literally like bent over a barbecue table vomiting mm. and then I kind of came to and realized someone was having sex with me from behind wow and I had just put it down to and, and then I realized who it was and mm. couldn't really do anything about it because I was too drunk to mm. walk really and then, yeah, it took me like a really long time. I think it was like since I met you and you're like... You were telling me about it and laughing and laughing and I'm like, <laughs> so that's a rape. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, 
what? And I'm like, yeah, yeah and that's I think, all right. I think, but you had told I me had, about it a few times, so knew, you knew something was I up. I knew, okay. and I had had other people tell me, but I didn't want to be someone that had been raped. Mm. I and I, want, felt, I felt the same I way. Yeah. Be, I didn't want to be that person. Yeah. Mm. That hasn't happened to me. Mm. Why would I want to be a victim of rape? That sounds awful. Like, I'm like, I'm confident. I would never let that happen. I don't let people treat me like that, but I'm like, yeah. What? So I just put it down to like, oh, I was drunk and that happened. Um, but I've, yeah, but the same person, I've literally had to like climb out a window before to get away from them. So it was like, right. I look back and I'm like, wow, that was some pretty bad repeat behavior. I got stuck in a chicken coop once at another party getting away from them. Then I stopped going to parties in this town. Yeah. Like this person would show up there everywhere. Right. Because so, that's... Have you had to hide in a chicken coop from a man trying to like have sex with you when you're so drunk? No. Yeah. I hope not. Maybe. <laughs> no, I mean, well, the arts, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's not an absurd there's plenty, story. There's plenty of prominent businessmen out there. Yeah. yeah. Who we cannot name. The other side, of course, is if you're a guy and you're at a party and you think a girl's into you, but she's playing hard to get by hiding in the chicken coop, <laughs> probably not into you. Pushing up one of those windows yeah, so yeah. you can climb out. I yeah. mean, to me, it's like smiling if yeah. you're hiding in a chicken coop. Yeah. I mean, I was... <laughs> Pretty flirty as a kid. <laughs> so I flirt. <laughs> yeah, I flirt by fleeing. That's my move. Yeah, my um, the one that affected me the most because the first one I was just kind of like, oh, that's being drunk at a party, but it nagged at me for years. Mm. And then when I watched um, what's that movie last year with a remember promising I had a young woman? Promising young woman. Mm. Fuck, I had a breakdown over that. Mm. I yeah, I have like, not seen it yet. Don't because of the breakdown you had about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't need that in my life. Yeah, that was an awful time for me, um, for days, weeks. Um, but the the guy that raped me, the time that affected me the most, out of all the times, because there's other times, I don't know if we have time to go into them all, um, but was a friend of mine who was staying with me. I was living overseas, um, and I expressly made sure that he knew that nothing was going to happen, mm. wouldn't have that relationship. And I woke up with him having sex with me without a condom as well, pushing him off going, what the fuck, man? And he's like, oh, sorry, I'm on, I was on auto fuck. Um, and the place where I was living was a very small town, um, police known for being extremely unhelpful and spreading gossip around. Mm. So I felt like I couldn't do anything there. Um, and then if I could, like, once I could return to New Zealand and knew he was here, like, what am I supposed to do mm. here? Because it happened in another country. Like, nobody can help me. Um, so I sent him an email telling him <laughs> all the places that I go that he's not allowed to or I will mm. tell all his entire friends and family and workplaces mm. um, that he's a massive fucking rapist. And I've since found out I'm not the only person that he's done that to. Right. Um, so, yeah, he's moved and changed his name. I'm like, good. Amazing. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. That thing you're talking about of going to the police... Mm. Um, you know, I, I used to do some work for the Sexual Abuse Prevention Network mm. and one of the things we were, we were told as um, program facilitators is well, to understand before the question's asked of us, uh, the police isn't always a happy ending. Mm. Uh, and, no. and, and more often than not. Mm. Can you guys speak to that a little bit? I've gone to the police about um, harassment and stalking before and found them entirely unhelpful. One time I had my nipples pinched on the train by a man who was getting off, and I went straight to the police station, and they just said, oh, you can't do anything about weirdos. You know, like, and I'm like, but the trains have cameras. And, like, train stations usually have mm. cameras. Like, what is the situation here? Like, why, why can't you do anything, sorry? Like, just super blown away. But a naive, you know, 15-year-old, mm. like, if the police say they can't help you, you don't have another step, mm -hmm. you know? And it was two dudes sitting behind a desk, like, giggling while I was telling them what happened and, you know, looking at each other like... Mm. So you just felt super humiliated by the whole thing and went away knowing that the police can't help you. Did you and that did men you probably know that. Did you feel like you could go back to them if something else happened? Or um, did it I feel like a closed door? It felt like a closed door, um, but I did go back to report different things and they just seemed like they didn't know what to do about stalking or cyber-stalking or um, harassment that isn't physical. 
mm. or violent. Mm. They were just like, well, they were asking me, like, what, what do you want us to do? Mm. You know? And it was like, I, I don't know. Like, well, I, I don't know the process. You know the process. You're the process people. Mm. Like, let's do the process. Um, I would like to think it's a bit different now because mm. this is, you know, 25 years ago. Um, mm. And 20 years ago and about 15 years ago. Mm. And then about six years ago. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I like to think it would be different. I like to think that enough people have made a fuss about, about that sort of treatment that the police will have made changes. I mean, obviously, Louise Nicholl, mm. Sin, mm. is that her name? Um, but six years, ago is, six years ago is 2015. Yeah. Well, like <laughs> you know, I think, I think I bring that up because I know the these kind of subjects are hard for people to listen mm. about. And so mm. sometimes, as a defense mechanism, their brains do that leap of, back in the day. Mm. Or, you know, oh, it w wouldn't happen. But, mm. you know. Why don't you go to the police? Yeah, and oh, you can go to the police now. Uh, mm. You couldn't back in the day. But if you stop and think of back in the day as 2015, that shouldn't be back in the day. And everyone's so against you. Like, you see mm. anyone complaining about sexual assault or anything like that and every comment is just like innocent till proven guilty like how do you know she's probably lying bitch she's doing it for attention she's doing it for money mm. like and that's what you're saying you're like well, why would i want to put myself through that either mm. what is it um you know gaslighting mm. uh i feel like that's still a new term even though the behavior is old yeah what does it do when you already have anxiety um and and, and other mental health things to have that kind of um, narrative of denial coming at you. Is that too... No, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'm like, I don't understand it. <laughs> I find it really unmooring, and I find that obviously it brings out the rage with no avenue to take that rage. Um, I actually took up kickboxing, um, to take out my rage after mm -hmm. an ex-boyfriend was really horrible and abusive and told me exactly how he was going to kill me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I took it up just so I could imagine his face on the fucking um, bag. And, like, it's, it's a really unmooring, unsettling feeling to feel spurred to action when there's no action. Mm -hmm. And it's consuming. And um, it's a terrible feeling, but it does provoke me to share more, make f other people feel comfortable to share more, make other people realise that it's not okay and it's not just them and they're not the problem and um, that it doesn't have to be like that, I guess. I think in a small way I feel like being open about my own experiences can sort of just do a tiny little thing to help the world be a bit a bit better for people, mm -hmm. a bit of a better experience, because we just get the one go, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, Ask us of every guest that we have, is there anything uh, that you guys would like to share in the shower? Because this is my safe space, and thank you so much for coming in and, and, mm. and making me laugh and Thanks bringing good chicken. Us. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's so fun. And we, we were so thrilled to be asked. You're such a joy and a light, <laughs> and we love you. I love you guys too, man, and I love that you are talking the talk um, and, and making it easier, I think. Mm. I think. Well, you're making it happen. <laughs> um, for, for other people. And I'm really, I like the chickpea salad. See, there you, go. you can take That's it That's not the important thing I wanted to share. <laughs> I, think, I think it's important. Um, I, th I think something we talked about with your producer outside mm. when we took a break earlier um, was interesting because he said, listening to the first part of the show, like I would never think that you two had anxiety. I would never think that you had all these struggles and because you're just, you know, you seem confident and happy. And I'm like, yes, and you can live a confident and happy and rich and rewarding and fulfilling life and have anxiety and panic attacks and, yeah. and and all these things happen. Like, it is not an inherent weakness or a flaw, and in some cases I think it can be um, a rich additional tool to your skill set. It's, mm. It can bring you a lot of um, compassion that you may not have felt before. It gives you attention to detail. Um, it keeps you alive sometimes, mm. you know, and makes you look out for yourself and for other people and um, 
Yeah, I don't think it's the opposite of being confident mm. and strong. It's all, yeah. it's all just one rich, complex person every single time. Everyone I meet with anxiety, I'm like, fuck yeah, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Get those panic attacks. And we're know? still out there. Like, we are very fortunate. We've both got good jobs mm. and we're chasing, like, our dreams of this crazy hobby that we've got when we say hobby <laughs> hobby's a terrible word to say um you know and our, our can, full-time jobs support our aspirations <laughs> yes our full-time jobs pay the bills a lot better than comedy does and it means that we can do comedy without being broke asses mm. uh, which we can't afford to be because she's got a dog and i've got a kid to support mm. so um but you know we can do all that while having ocd attacks and imagine ourselves cutting our arms with a knife constantly for about two weeks and then it goes away. Like, we can do all of that at once, you know? Mm. We're not limited. <laughs> Eating Fried Chicken in the Shower is produced for RNZ by Charlie Bleakley of Fruit and Nut Production. The engineer is Ronnie Powick. The executive producers are Justin Gregory and Tim Watkin. You can find this podcast however you just found this podcast. Or if you're listening on the radio, go to RNZ's podcast page and look for the chicken. If you're rating podcasts and you want to rate ours, give us five stars. Remember, more stars, more chicken. If you want to share your comfort food and your mental health safe space with me, then you can tweet me on at James Norquise. If you're experiencing mental health issues and you're in New Zealand, you can text 1737 or go to the RNZ Fried Chicken page and we'll have a list of different mental health practitioners that might be able to assist you. If because of the pandemic you're experiencing COVID-related mental health issues, you can go to www.health.govt.nz. Look for the COVID page and you'll be able to find mental health resources there. Stay safe. Matawa. <laughs>